why boxing? So my partner, Reggie, introduced me to boxing. And even when he first brought it up, I was adamantly against it. So our story is that he and I met on Tinder, I think at this point, eight years ago. Wait, they, wait, I don't think I've ever yeah. had an entrepreneur say they met their co-founder on Tinder. You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. This episode of Side Hustle Pro is brought to you by Comcast Rise. Comcast Rise is a multi-year commitment to provide marketing, creative, media, and technology services to qualifying small businesses owned by underrepresented groups, beginning with a focus on Black-owned businesses. I've checked out all of the levels of support Comcast Rise offers, and it is incredible, you guys. When I'm looking for opportunities, I personally seek out programs that are going to provide guidance from someone more experienced or that offer resources I need for my business. And that's exactly what Comcast Rise offers. Selected businesses could receive one or more of the following business services— advertising and marketing consultations, or production of a 30-second TV commercial, plus a media strategy consultation and 90-day media placement schedule, or the chance to get a complete technology makeover of computer equipment and internet voice and cybersecurity services for 12 whole months. And there's opportunity for monetary grants as well. So definitely, definitely check this program out, you guys, to apply today for marketing, media, and tech makeovers at no cost to help you and your business rise. Visit sidehustlepro.co slash Comcast Rise. One more time, that is sidehustlepro.co slash Comcast Rise. Hey, hey guys, welcome, welcome back to the show. It's Nikayla here, and today in the guest chair, we have Angela Jennings. Angela is co-founder of Boombox Boxing Club, a boxing-inspired hip-hop-fueled fitness studio. Angela is a finance professional at a global accounting firm by day, and she always knew she wanted to tap into her interest in food or fitness. After being introduced to boxing three years ago by her friend and now co-founder, Reggie Smith, Angela became passionate about the sport's potential to be a fun and powerful workout to people of all fitness levels and backgrounds. The pair launched their first studio in Washington, D.C. in 2019, and it's now host to members who sweat through theme boxing workouts or one-on-one private training with coaches. Now, we all know we're in the time of COVID, so in this episode, I really love what Angela had to share about navigating the fitness industry during COVID and how she's working to adapt. Let's get right into it. Welcome to the guest chair, first and foremost, Angela. I just read your bio. You are this finance professional. You're a CPA at a global accounting firm by day. What made you interested in finance growing up? You know, that is a funny question. I actually was absolutely not interested in finance or accounting. I wanted to go to culinary school. And um, being from the South, I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. And being the first person to go to college on uh, my mom's side of the family, and actually the second person since my dad, my mother was like, you are absolutely not going to school to cook. Like, I'm just totally against it. You can cook in your own time because for her, that just was not a career to go after just based on how she grew up and her upbringing. And so once I got to college in Memphis, I I did business administration as an undergraduate. I was like, well, I'll figure out what I want to do since my mom won't let me you know, go to school to cook per se and, uh, and get this business degree. And once I graduated, I actually thought I was going to go to law school. Um, that was going to be my, my fallback plan. I wanted to be a judge, but instead of going to law school right out, I said, I'm going to wait a year and apply for the LSAT at the university that I was at because I knew I could do it in a year and finish. I had enough credits and uh, I finished that program. I have a master's of science in accounting and said, I'm done going to school. So I'm just sitting here with this accounting degree. And that literally is the story of how I worked my world, um, worked my way into the accounting and finance world and ultimately ended up becoming a CPA. 
thank you for sharing. And I am sure there are a lot of accountants, lawyers, doctors out there right now who wanted to do something else, but we appreciate you guys. You know, I appreciate you for sure when it becomes tax time. So, (laughs) but I know that you've said that you always knew you wanted to, at some point, tap into that interest in food or fitness. Now, what was your approach to side hustling throughout your career? So I was always doing something and side hustling, meaning I wanted to work out, I would work out with my friends. I was cooking, but once I moved to DC, I I wasn't, um, all of my, I had friends that were in college and in grad school. And I was like, well, if they don't like it, they have to eat it anyway, because they're in school and that's what we do when we're in college. We eat (laughs) whatever, exactly. We appreciate who's ever cooking. And so I was always doing that on the side. And on my own time. And interestingly enough, I actually was scared of the word entrepreneur. I never wanted to do it. I always thought that it wasn't for me. Either I wasn't good enough to do it. I really just need to go and find my space, climb the world of corporate America, and really be happy because that's what our parents wanted us to do. And I just thought I was good at executing and being in the background. And at some point, I just kept telling myself or accepting the fact I just was not happy with this. I was like, I just don't want to do this. And slowly but surely I kept saying, Angela, can you do this? Like, can you be an entrepreneur? And I was, I was literally fighting myself and telling myself, no, even though I was not happy with being in corporate America. And eventually I realized I couldn't, I couldn't say no anymore. And it was going to be food or fitness. And after meeting my partner, my partner, Reggie, And us working out together, literally, that's how we built our relationship. That's how we built our friendship. And it was, you know, fitness was going to be the space. And I was going to do it with or without um, literally starting as a full-time entrepreneur or, you know, staying in corporate America. But I just knew it had to be something. And that's kind of how the seed was actually planted. And me realizing I can step into doing something behind my own and I, uh, on my own, excuse me, and I don't have to hide behind the veil of either a big company or someone else. Like, Angela, you could be the face. And speaking of scary, you aren't the only one who was afraid or didn't see yourself as an entrepreneur. That's a common refrain among guests on the show, and including myself. That's the reason why we started this show, to kind of dispel that myth of what an entrepreneur looks like. So as you started exploring, getting comfortable with the idea, first of all, what, why boxing? So my partner, Reggie, introduced me to boxing. And even when he first brought it up, I was adamantly against it. So our story is that he and I met on Tinder, I think at this point, eight years ago. He was the first person I actually met in person. Wait, wait, wait. I don't think I've ever <laughs> had an entrepreneur say they met their co-founder on Tinder. But, but yes. continue. We met on Tinder. I know, I haven't heard that story either. And I was like, I just, I can't believe we said this. He actually was the first person I actually met in person off of that app. And when we first met, it actually, it was, we, we were really good friends. We never dated. And it actually started as a back and forth banter from the beginning. And all we did when we hung out together, he was living in New York at, at the time I was traveling for work and we would always work out. We were always working out and he was into kind of combat sports. And at this point, my college and, and kind of where, what I did in college and where I settled was running tracks. So I was just into like different types of workout activity. He was like, I should show you, you know, you should try boxing. I was like, absolutely not. Like, I have no interest in boxing, you know, at all. It's just not my thing. And he was like, no, I'm gonna show you how to box. Like, uh, he was insistent. He is so persistent in everything we do. And we started working out with him when I would be in New York during the week. And I actually just started to fall in love with it. And over time, I was like, I'm just gonna go, you know, and get me a coach and work out while I'm in DC and start to train and boxing. And I just loved, it was completely challenging. It was new for me. I loved what it was doing to my body. I was starting to get lean. I realized, you know, I was working my legs, my core, um, my upper body, everything at the same time. And every time, even though I was terrible when I first started, like most people, but every time I just accomplished something small, I was so happy about it. I mean, it was the biggest deal. And so I just completely fell in love with boxing. And I was like, I get it. Like, I see why, you know, he was so excited about it. And I, and I would love other people to, you know, feel this way. So why did you guys decide to start Boombox? boxing. So it's one thing to go from, oh, I really enjoy this. I like what it does to my body to now saying, let's open a boxing studio. So we were approaching that place in our career at the same time. We both were climbing the ladder. We were both actually excelling 
in our careers, but we were both like, what are we going to do when we grow up? I knew I didn't want to stay in the space that I was in. And it's something we used to talk about all the time. And we would throw things out there and, and come up with stuff. And I kept saying, it has to be food or fitness for me. Like, I don't know what it is. And I knew he was interested in fitness. And we literally we were so close. We used to talk all the time. And literally one day, um, he suggested he had been going to a kickboxing studio and suggested that maybe we consider franchising a concept that was already uh, growing on the uh, East Coast and actually in the West Coast. And we actually went down that lane really only for a couple of weeks until one day we were having a conversation about it and really didn't think it was the right move for us after we decided, you know, we want to do something, we want to open up a space. And we decided, you know, these two little black kids, no one would ever think that they could actually go out and do something on, on their own. Why don't we just go ahead and try to create something on our own and build our own space from the ground up? And we looked at each other and we were like, I think this is crazy. And right when we both said, I think this is crazy, we were like, we're going to do it. Like, this is a great idea and we're going to do it. And that is exactly how Boombox was born. And we knew we wanted to do, Reggie was living in New York at the time. His name is Reggie uh, Smith. Back to D.C., he actually was born and raised here in the Maryland area. And we decided the perfect space would be to do it here in D.C. where there was not a huge market in this area and there was a need and we thought that we could create the community, create the space, show the accessibility and, you know, driving our personalities into it. We thought that we could really, we could really make it work. Now there are a couple of things that I want to break down here because when you said you thought about franchising, doing the franchise model, um, you know, I think that's something that is so critical to just talk about a little bit more because a lot of us will think, Hey, all right, I can't do my own thing or I can't start my own thing. What if I try to somehow get down with someone else's concept, mm-hmm. right? Or or I, I want to be the next X. So first of all, when you were thinking about that, what ultimately led you to say, you know what, we can do this on our own? Like, what was it in internally that led you there? We didn't feel like it represented us. And you're absolutely right. Like coming out of corporate, it was kind of like that hedge. It was like, we're kind of doing it on our own, but not really. We can franchise and still have that, that fallback, someone else to call, someone else to help us figure it out. But that, right. even though we were both kind of interested in this space, and I actually wasn't a huge fan of kickboxing myself. I was like, I just want my feet to stay on the ground. But that space really didn't represent us. And we wanted something that we could put our personality into. One thing that was huge for us was that we wanted it, a space to be super inclusive and to be diverse. We didn't necessarily see that in the concept that we were looking in. And we were like, we won't necessarily, I mean, we'd be, we'd be two faces there, but I don't know if we'd have control over that as a, a overall brand, you know, just be our facility. And so as we were sitting down and thought about what was truly important to us as related to accessibility, as related to um, having an inclusive environment and an inclusive space, having the ability to, you know, have control over what we're doing, what we're putting out there and being able to pivot if it wasn't working for us, you know, that is really, as we were sitting there thinking about kind of the pros and cons of doing something on our own, or actually not even, we weren't even discussing us, but of doing the, the franchise plan, you know, even though we were scared out of our minds, that's, that's the moment that we realized this isn't us. And if we really want to create something that's us and for the vision that we have, like we're going to have to do it on our own. And that's how we we ultimately got to that decision. I'm so glad you touched on that. It's that whole, it, it's something you have to think about when, with an entrepreneur. Every single move you make, you have to think about the that aspect of how much can I control? Who is the decision maker? Whether it's giving away pieces of your business, whether it's bringing on a co-founder, right? So you say, I want to move away from that franchise model. You had to realize that, hey, that model would not allow me to truly define the brand the way I want to define the brand. And that's so key for anyone thinking about franchise model. Now, how did you go about deciding that you guys, not only was it right to start this new business, but you also were the right co-founders for each other? That's a question I don't know if we have the answer to. (laughs) I think every day we're trying to decide if we're the right co-founders for each other. But what we did know, we, we knew we had respect for each other. We knew that we, 
valued each other's opinions. And I think what was key for us, though, is that our strengths were in polar opposite areas where I had a whole Reggie was very strong in that area and vice versa for me. And at the end of the day, it was together, we really did have a great partnership, whether it was our project management ability, my strength in accounting, his strength in finance, both of our passion for boxing, going out of drive, our ability to train other people. Because again, it's one thing for you to know something, but it's different for you to be able to help somebody else pick it up. But our ability to inspire over time, we just decided that, you know, if it would be anybody else, if, I mean, if I were going to go into business with somebody right now, the person that would be the best fit for this and where we are and the passion and drive, the passion and drive that we have, um, it would be you. And so, and it doesn't come without its challenges. It's interesting that we do have this men and uh, and woman dynamic. It brings its challenges, but it also has its benefits as well. And I tell everybody, this is really my first marriage. This is my first test into marriage and what it Talk looks like. It. And the Talk about it. <laughs> uh, and, and the compromise and the, you know, really having to work through it because birth this thing and we have to make it no matter what's happening, it's here. And we have to figure this thing out and we have to make it work. And so he and I, we do make really, really good partners and we, we, we work through things. We have, again, we have our challenges uh, as with anybody else, but, you know, we're committed to this and we're committed to making it work and we know it's going to be, you know, very successful. It's going to do well. Indeed. It's funny you mentioned the marriage thing because someone recently, I was doing like a, a chat with um, some employees about side hustling and someone brought up, should I partner or how do I pick a partner? And my question to her was, do you want to be married to that person? <laughs> you know, like, are, are you comfortable entering into a marriage where you are now bonded for life? And there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. It's just, you have to be able to say yes to that question. Mm. So what were the first steps you took to get started? What financing would look like. Um, financing would look like, and after we determined it was going to be in D.C., what was the best space for us? Reggie and I actually self-financed, which was a huge decision for us. And so we didn't um, borrow a huge uh, lump a sum of money up front. We were determined to try to do it on our own and, and do it within our circle. And so that was that was step one to determining, again, uh, the third thing would probably be what did we wanted this space to look like. How do we want people to feel? So not the physical space, but how do we actually want people to feel when they stepped into uh, this studio around our people, around our team. So making sure that we knew what kind of people that we wanted, what type of coaches we wanted, what we wanted it to look and feel like. I mean, Reggie and I are Black people, and we wanted to make sure that the space represented us and that we were not afraid to be Black in our Black space. And that was actually a concern for us. Can do we make it too, you know, are, are we, are we going to be considered as, as too Black and will everyone come? And so really determining what financing was going to look making sure that we, you know, identified the proper location and making sure we knew what we wanted, the look and feel of our space and identifying that brand and who would actually encompass that brand as far as the other team members that we brought along. And you're both, you're in different cities. So how, what is the process of finding the space and deciding this is it look like? <laughs> A lot of FaceTime video. I mean, I would be out um, looking at spaces. We would have a, um, we had a broker and it, it was literally like looking for a house. I'm, I'm there in this space. Reggie is on FaceTime looking. Um, if I thought that it was a space for him to come and see, he would come down every two weeks and look at the narrow down the one or two that I thought was a good space. So all around DC, we did a lot of things digitally and we actually identified the space right before Reggie actually moved to DC. So it was a interesting, we were virtual before the entire world moved virtual in, in 2020 um, as we, we looked for our space very virtually. So we, we were here and it was, it was a huge effort, but we, uh, we made Love that. And so now what was opening day like? First of all, let, let's let's backtrack. What what did you do leading up to opening day? How did you attract customers, get the word out, and market the business? 
Whew, wow. So that that is so funny. It seems like it was a whirlwind uh, of a period of time. But everything from we actually um, did a lot of pop up things. So we were working out in the park, getting our names out there. We opened in July of 2020. We launched our Instagram page in January of 2020. And we had this idea where we we're going to do this kind of like virtual uh, Wait, sorry. launch you said party. You launched your Instagram in January of 2020. I'm sorry, January 2019. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> My bad. I, I apologize. Misspoke. Definitely January of 2019. We first launched our Instagram. We created this homemade video that we edited ourselves. All the colors are, are completely off. However, we had a super dope video that we thought at the time. And we literally sent it to all of our friends, access to send it to all of their friends. And we all we had one day, one time that we wanted to kind of launch and create this kind of small media storm on social media like what is this what is this thing what is this thing happening to get a lot of people excited about it so we literally had everybody to launch on i think it was a monday at 12 o'clock we sent this video and said everybody post your instagrams at the same time and ask your friends to do it they kind of gave people some encouragement to help us out and so that was day one and from there happy hours pop-up workouts in the park we actually partnered with um, Lululemon at the time in the area for which our studio was going to be opening. And we actually did pop out workouts there every Saturday. So again, just getting people in the boom box vibe at boom box, we actually box to the beat. So it felt like you, it feels like you're dancing while you're working out at the same time. And from there it was, you know, who we are, you know, who could we talk to popping up at different community events and just making ourselves accessible. Cause again, we were brand new brand, uh, brand new brand. Um, we weren't fitness influencers or hadn't been uh, instructors at any other fitness facility. So we really had to build our reputation as it related to, you know, boxing and coming into this world. The other thing that happened that uh, really wasn't planned is I actually boxed in my first amateur boxing match, which was not something that I actually set out wow. to do. And that happened in February, 2019. And so it, it was a whirlwind getting um, to that space. And so again, that gave me credibility in the boxing world and amateur boxing and, and that space as well. So, you know, making sure that we were just using our resources, using the community that we had to connect to other people, started some marketing in terms of, you know, reaching out and inviting different um, people from the city, community organizers or other influencers uh, in the city to come and try out our space around that June, July timeframe, right before we opened. And um, we opened up Jan- um, excuse me, July 29th, 2019. And uh, we have been on a whirlwind from there. Yeah. What was opening day like? Opening day. We woke up that morning. We actually did our tape cutting, our ribbon cutting um, that afternoon. Opening day, we we invited guests so we could have a number of people there to share this space with us. I mean, it was a big party. And it was I can't explain that feeling. I mean, I was so fearful. I was so excited. I I ran the gamut of emotions that morning. My partner, it was so funny. I had never seen him be so emotional. And even for him, I mean, he must have cried a hundred times that day. And I was like, who are you? You know, he was just really, I know he was just, it was crazy. And I was like, I don't even know what to do with this. It was, it was just, it was such a, a big moment. All of our family and friends were out, even if they weren't there to, to work out and actually see people walk into this space, you know, cause that moment, you never know if people are going to come, you know, creating this space the full first week we were doing free workouts. We just wanted people to come and have this experience and, you know, want to test and see what it was that we were trying to delivered to the community and it was amazing and Kayla people came and I was yes, just did. excited about that did. I was just like oh my god people actually showed up and are you know <laughs> are they going to keep coming and so um it was a it was a great feeling it was an amazing feeling and and you know I I can't I cannot I cannot fully articulate it into words, but it was awesome. It was awesome. Hey guys, it's Michaela here with a quick word from our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. 
Skillshare offers creative classes designed for real life and all of the circumstances that come with it. These lessons can help you stay inspired and express yourself, not to mention keep your business organized and thriving until you're able to hire more help. And now Skillshare is offering two weeks free for Side Hustle Pro listeners. I recently took a new Skillshare class called Storytelling for Leaders, How to Craft Stories That Matter. And I just found it really helpful as I think about how I want to improve my skills as a storyteller and enhance the stories I bring you on this podcast every week. What I love about Skillshare is that it offers membership with meaning. You can really get a lot of value from these classes with so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives, Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash hustle. The first 1,000 people to use the Skillshare.com slash hustle link will get a free trial of Skillshare premium membership. So go ahead and again, that's Skillshare.com slash hustle. Do you sew, knit, crochet, or do any kind of fabric crafts? Well, you know what you can do when you finish a big project, right? You can add your label to it. I'd like to tell you about a cool new crafting store called Dutch Label Shop. Dutch Label Shop produces retail quality woven clothing labels. Their labels are the same kind of durable fabric labels that you see on big brands in stores. They have figured out a way to make the same high quality labels at virtually any quantity and at an affordable price. Whether your side hustle is knitting items, or maybe you're an Etsy or Shopify store owner, the presentation and price point of your items increases exponentially with a professional label. And that's what Dutch Label Shop provides. In addition to woven labels, Dutch Label Shop also offers printed care labels. You know, the ones that tell you how to wash and care for an item. Plus, they offer pre-made size labels and custom hand tags. And right now, Side Hustle Pro listeners can get a special discount on every label product that Dutch Label Shop sells. Head over to DutchLabelShop.com and enter promo code HUSTLEPRO at checkout to save 15% off your order. Are they going to keep coming? That's my question. You know, how was that first year? How did you do with member retention and growth? The first year we were, we were a slow growing business. And so of course, after the, the enthusiasm and the magic of week one and week work and and free workouts, it became, okay, now are people going to pay to come? And for us, it truly, it was, it was not easy. I mean, we ran classes with, three people, five people, and our space hosts 30 people a class. And so it was, you know, are we doing everything right to get people to come into this space? Are we, you know, are we thinking about, we're thinking about class times, you know, what do we need to change? What levers do we need to pull to get people to come? And, you know, it was really just the other piece of it was just stay focused. Like we don't, you know, maybe for some people they open up and now they're like, you know, we have a line out the door, you know, it's a club line every single day. But for us, it was not like that. And so we really just had, it was a slow grind. We had to stick to our guns and just say, we know people will come. Our goal is to continue to deliver the product, continue to be our authentic selves, continue to to motivate and inspire the way we know that we can. And we believe that people will come. And it, it took some time closer to that November, December time frame. We started running different types of challenges and marketing activity and, and getting people to invite others. And that's when we really started to see the growth. Things really started to turn around. And around January, from a monthly cost per- perspective, we actually broke even. We finally broke even around six months, a little over six months after opening. And of course, in March of 2020, as with most gyms, we had to shut down. And so that that was definitely something that, you know, as an entrepreneur, we know that anything can happen at any time. But I don't think any of us were expecting something like this, even your worst planning, you know, the worst thing that can happen is not that you just shut down completely unexpectedly. And of course, that is what happened with all of us in March of 2020, thanks to COVID-19. Exactly. And, so, and it's nothing you can buffer for. So let, so you broke even six months in. You, you just don't think that, hey, 
my business will be shut down for months on end. So what what have you guys done to manage in the time of COVID? We have com- we completely pivoted to virtual initially, as with many other businesses, and we didn't have the we you know one day we were hoping to expand into the virtual space, but of course we didn't have to we didn't plan to do it overnight. So even overnight, the goal was how do we stay connected to our members? How do we keep them moving and engaged? Because we you know everybody is going through this, not just us. And so we started with just doing free workouts on Instagram Live until we were able to identify and set up a process to go on Zoom. So we've done Zoom workouts. And now that things are starting to move along a little bit, we're doing outdoor workouts. And thankfully, our space was able to reopen to holding in-studio workouts in July of 2020. So we're kind of kind of have this triage of workout um, a, a capabilities that, you know, we're inviting people who aren't comfortable to come into the studio. They can still work out online or either outdoors. And, you know, we also had to focus on other things in, as, it, as it relates to, you know, our rent. We had to go back and negotiate with our landlord because even as we're back opening, you know, our operating costs, the economics are, are not the same. And so we've had the challenges of, you know, making sure that economically, you know, we're doing at least enough to maintain and sustain through 2020 until we're able to return to some type of normalcy. And we were really lucky in that our landlord was willing to work with us. Now, it took a couple of negotiations. It did not come easy and it did not happen the first time around. (laughs) But we were like, listen, we are all in this together and everybody's taking an L here. And if we rise back up, you know, the the water rises all boats. And so, you know, let's work together and, and like make this happen. And then we're also, you know, truly focused on the comfort of our members and making sure that they feel comfortable and they feel safe to come back in any uh, aspect that we have, whether it be in the studio, outside or working out online. And I'm glad you pushed because, I mean, I know I would be scared of that no from the landlord or that initial, even that initial no. Once you actually work up the nerve to have the conversation, mm-hmm. it's like you forget that, hey, you have leverage. It's it's a it's a two-way street. They need you. Exactly. You need them. And you, you have to approach it that way. So I hope this, this encourages some other entrepreneurs, some other business owners to renegotiate, to keep having and pushing the conversation. Because look, this thing is unprecedented. We don't know how long it's going to last. Yes. And we have got to find a way to work within it when possible. So yes. now speaking of losing or just, you know, things not being what you expect, a lot of people lose money in their first few years of their business. And it's something like we touched on that they might even buffer for, right? In terms of how much they raise, even in a family and friends round. This being being something that actually has just stripped you of revenue, what has been your experience now as you're planning into 2021 and the future with losing money and then planning how you can increase cash flow to put it into the business and ultimately be profitable? Ooh, that is a question that we are still finding the answer to. <laughs> we are in the midst of, you know, continuously strategizing. It's it's like for the last three months, it was how do we stay alive right now? How do we make sure we do not fall off the ship right now? Because as we know, some businesses already have closed their doors and there are others who are still hoping to reopen and have not done so already. And we were fortunate in that, you know, and I know some of this is attributed to both Reggie and I's finance and accounting background that we were, we were, our goal was to make sure that we had a level of liquidity and that we always had some level of liquidity there. And so we kind of took some in some extra capital and made sure we had something there for a rainy day for a period like this, even though this is definitely not what it was that we've expect that we expected. And so we're in the midst of right now saying, okay, now we've We've, we've, we've settled the tide just a little bit. The doors are back open. We're happening, you know, things are happening virtually. We've now renegotiated, you know, the rent and some of our bigger expenses, but for everything else, I mean, we've had to revisit every cost on what we're, what we're spending on marketing expenses, what we're spending on payroll, you know, everything has gotten streamed back. So first step was to cut costs across the board. And then the next step was, again, now how can we, maintain because now you know it's summer and you know we're going into the fall and school is about to start and now you know everybody's doing stuff you know online all day and 
you know, the parents are working online, their students, their kids are working online. When they're done with the, you know, classes at, the, excuse me, with their work at the end of the day, are gonna are they gonna want to look at the screen again and stay virtual? And so we're in the midst of that point of now, how do we keep this going? Do we put more time and energy into virtual classes? You know, once it gets cold in DC, no one's gonna want to be outside, and if people are still not comfortable as much coming into the studio as yet where is it that we go? And, you know, these are very hard questions for us. And these are questions that we have not yet found all the answers to. But our goal was to ensure that we at least have some ability to maintain through 2021 by continuously cutting that cost, continuously finding different ways, again, that we're, you know, keeping people coming in the door. And then we're also considering what other avenues can we one provide to our members that will also be a good uh, uh, be a good expansion for us as well things like nutrition i mean we can give people workouts all the time but you know may obviously we all know without food that's the 80 percent of you know getting our, our our bodies in a good space that we want them to be you know maybe we should pivot into other areas that we're considering so if i'm being honest we definitely have more questions than we have answers right now and that's real, and and I appreciate it. Yeah, that that's for a lot of us. Um, so you're you're not the only one in that boat. And I I just want to say, be encouraged because this is one of this is definitely a defining moment for all of us. And you never know what's on the other side of this moment. So there are companies that have started out for just one thing. Like I I, I think. I was, you know, for example, researching um, a bike. I won't say the name of the brand, right? But I was researching a bike the other day. um, And I was surprised to learn that it has this app with other kinds of workouts, right? So you might start a main thing and think that people are coming to this for this main thing. And then you start offering all this other stuff. And next thing you know, people are bigging up your, your app for all the you know, other workouts that you get inside of it or what have you. You never know what's on the other side. Like you just think about the, the people who didn't pivot to digital early, who laughed at like a Netflix, you know, like, oh, people are always going to want to come in and pick up their DVDs. What are you talking about? <laughs> So be encouraged with that. And I I love that you guys are are sharing with us in the midst of this moment. And um, for all my DC folks, Southeast DC folks, definitely check out Boombox. Um, I'm seeing a lot of gyms do some really interesting socially distant things inside. Do you guys do any of that? And and have people um, been comfortable with those measures? Yes, absolutely. So our class normally holds 29 people um, and we are now at 11 people per class. And so we are completely spaced out across the class And DC now has a mandate that we have to wear our masks no matter what we're doing. So during the workout as well, I mean, coming in the studio during your entire workout, which I know is a challenge for some people, but we are maintaining distance. We're working out with our mask on the entire time. And our classrooms have a little less um, moving around the space. And so we, everyone kind of, I mean, the way that we have aqua bags in our space and everyone is kind of confined to um, their own kind of five by seven square feet of space. And so we are we are very distance operating on a, a super reduced capacity, but still giving people, you know, the same work. It's still the same boom box moving around. Our coaches stay relegated to the stage again so they're not walking through the studio as well where people are working out so that when you do come in you kind of have your space you stay in it you you don't share equipment so you use your own equipment you know you leave it on the floor when you're done and so making sure that people are comfortable that they can come in the space they they have distance they they know they're not sharing equipment and that they what's most important they're still leaving inspired and getting the same nice sweat and the same kind of workout now you spent a good deal of time in corporate America. Are you still juggling the full time by day and boombox by night? I am. And juggling is the best word to use. (laughs) Juggling is the word. How how are you doing that? How are you doing that? Some days I ask myself and it's a challenge. I will say some days I probably do a little bit more boombox work than I should. Um, and, and other days, nothing happens that I plan to happen 
for the day. And I've learned to delegate a little more. I think when we're starting out, you know, you want to control so many elements of it because, you know, you're building this thing and you're like, it has to be, you know, this way and it has to be right. But I've learned to trust the team members that I've brought on board to learn how to delegate it a little bit more, but it still doesn't make it easy. I mean, some days I just don't do a good job at all. And I fell at both if I'm being truly transparent, but I know that, you know, this boombox, I'm going to make it work. That's where my passion is. And ultimately I want to, I want to step away from corporate America, but I, I still pride myself on just when I'm going to do something, doing it well. And, um, you know, I, I wake up every day saying, you know, it's going to work. It may not work perfectly today, but <laughs> by the end of the week, most of everything that I wanted to happen will happen. And the rest that doesn't happen, it probably wasn't as important anyway. It'll happen. It'll happen next week or at some point before it's actually due. So it's a challenge. I hear that. <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> Looking back, would you do anything differently on the road to launching Boombox? One of the biggest things that I have had the conversation with myself was if I were to do it again, I probably would have jumped off the deep end and went full time entrepreneurship from the beginning. Even in COVID, even when I kind of thought back and said, thank God, I'm still glad I have my full time job that I can fall back on. But even then, I had think that I would have, I'm, I'm always asking myself how much the boombox could have been along, not considering, you know, this pandemic that we're in, if I did not have the fear of walking away from my day job. And it really was a fear. And now I don't have that as much anymore. I'm like, yeah, so you could have done this. You really could have done this and you can could have made it work. Like it's working. And for me, it was really just my own fear. It was really challenging myself of, you know, all this, these years of convincing myself that I wasn't meant to be an entrepreneur. So I can't just step into it. And so I got to do a little bit at a time. And and that's really what it was. But in hindsight, I'm, I'm probably going to always ask myself whether or not you know, I could have just stepped into it and just said, you know what, Angela, this is what you want to do. And this is what you're going to do. And it's going to be successful. That's, that is the one thing that I would have done differently. Indeed. That mental, that self-talk is so, so mm-hmm. important. All that matters is you're doing it now. And now is the time that you were meant to do it. Mm-hmm. So um, it, it happened when it's supposed to. Speaking of having that full time, um, you spent uh, how many years is it now? 16, 17 years in uh, yeah. no, over 10 years of experience as yes. CPA? Yes. It's been a challenge. <laughs> so you have over 10 years of experience in, in the world of accounting and, and having a CPA. Um, what are some of the lessons you took away from that that working experience that you applied to your growing business? I think you know, the, for the good part. So the, the things that I've learned, the skills that I picked up in terms of project management, how to manage, you know, our financials for small business, especially our understanding of financials and uh, what's happening in our business and what certain numbers mean is so, so huge. And I, I realized how, you know, how blessed we are that, we're able to to see those things and, and look ahead and have that on our own without that being just one other expense that we have to entrust into someone else um, to tell us. It also really, you know, helped me in terms of, you know, working hard, really having to, you know, that, that 80 hours a week, that 90 hours a week that's happening if it's a busy season or if it's a crazy client to, you know, be ready to adjust to that and accommodate that. The other part I learned from that is, you know, we're really client based and Boombox is client based as well. And it's really how to accommodate, how to ensure that our members are happy, really understanding that you may have to adjust and you have to pivot because everyone is not the same. So how to be flexible while also still delivering what you're trying to deliver at the same time. And, you know, and just generally speaking for me, some days it's going to be hard. Some days I'm not going to be as happy, but I'm going to remember the end goal, even, you know, in my day job, whether it's, you know, whatever it is that we're trying to deliver or have to deliver. And it's same thing as it relates to boomboxing. People are coming there. This is their outlet. This is their moment of 
the day that they want to, whatever their reasons are, they just want to hit something, they want to sweat, they want to come and feel inspired and, and they want to, you know, really feel like they're in the fight and, you know, whatever it is that they're getting, our ultimate goal is to deliver it to them, whatever it, however it looks, what it looks like. If I, if I had to stay up all night, if I, you know, forgot to do something in a day and I messed up something on the playlist, the goal is I, we have a product that we have to deliver at the end of the day. There's a feeling we want you to have at the end of the day when you receive our workout or, or the message that we're trying to deliver in terms of, you know, mentally, how are we trying to get you to walk away from the studio? And we have to get it done. I mean, corporate America is tough. And at the end of the day, all they care about is you getting it done. And, you know, in Boombox, it's, you know, it's a different type of way, but our goal is we want to get it done because we want to get it done for you. We want to get it done for those numbers that are coming in there for us. Amen. Now, what would you say is next for Boombox? Knowing what you know in this moment. Boombox is going to make it out of the pandemic of 2020, step one. (laughs) That is where we're starting first. Um, We are claiming it. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Like that is definitely step one. I truly see us, you know, Reggie and I, when we set out to do this, we never wanted to be a one stop shop. We never wanted to just have one studio in one place. We want to grow. We're looking at multiple locations across different areas, you know, additional locations in DC, but definitely across different areas in the United States. And as you said, like we want Boombox to be a platform for us to be able to do other things and to elevate our voices in the community with other disadvantaged children, other um, women, and even even ex-cons, right? Introducing them to fitness, again, expanding. So as we're talking about nutrition, as we're talking about um, mental wellness, understanding like, you know, fitness is, is great. Like this is our baseline. This is our, our bread and butter, our concept. But we want to be able to do more. And we're hoping that Boombox will allow us to elevate our voices and really dig into the community to allow people to either express themselves through fitness um, and wellness and or just learn more about our story and entrepreneurship and over overcoming fear and overcoming all of that self-doubt that you had to literally just shoot yourselves out there, shoot for the stars and do something else that you want to do. And at the end of the day, if that one thing doesn't work out, like there, you still can do something else. Like I'm still a CPA. So I still have another talent that I can fall back on. Even if this one thing that this one lane, rather I should use that word, this one lane came to a dead end. There's several other lanes out there. So I'm hoping that this Boombox itself as an established as a fitness studio grows, but also the message that we're trying to both represent and to share with other others that that continues to grow as well. So now, Angela, it's time to transition to the lightning round okay. where you, you just answer the very first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Okay. Whew, I think I am. I'm ready. Okay, let's go. Number one, what is a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? Mine is very simple. My Google Calendar. (laughs) That is my one thing. Number two, what has been the best business book or best business podcast that you have consumed this year? The Four Minute Work Week. Hmm. Number three, what is a non-negotiable part of your daily routine? Breakfast. Everyone can tell if I have not eaten in the morning. (laughs) Number four, what is a personal habit that has helped you significantly as you're growing your business? Right. I write everything down. Everything. Mm. And then finally, share with us your parting advice for fellow Black women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing a steady paycheck. My advice is to go for it. Shoot for the stars. There is no reward without the risk. And at the end of the day, it's for you. It may not happen tomorrow or the next day, but it's ultimately going to be yours. No one else can take that from you. Yes. And finally, where can people connect with you and Boombox after this episode? Absolutely. You connect with my page personally at AJ underscore Boomin. That's B-O-O-M-I-N on Instagram. You can also find Boombox on Instagram at Boombox, B-O-O-M-B-O-X 
underscore boxing, as well as our website, www.boombox-boxing.com. All right, guys, there you have it. Remember to check out this episode with the show notes at sidehustlepro.co. Thank you so much for being in the guest chair, Angela. Thank you, Nikayla. All right, and we will talk to you next week. Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other side hustlers just like you to find the show. And if you want to hear more from me, you can follow me on Instagram at Side Hustle Pro. Plus, sign up for my six bullet Saturday newsletter at sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter. When you sign up, you will receive weekly nuggets from me, including what I'm up to, personal lessons, and my business tip of the week week. Again, that's sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter to sign up. Talk to you soon.